Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to give everyone just a few minutes to log into Zoom or to join us on Facebook. We are very excited to have you join us for our October live chat. We're going to be talking about what it means well to live till the end. And I am joined by a very special guest, Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Uh, hi, Shoshana, how are you today? Hi, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for being here. I'm gonna introduce Shoshana more formally in just a moment, but uh, we're so glad that you're here with us. We would love to know where you're coming to us from. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you can chat into the comment section. If you're joining us on Zoom, uh, there is a chat box below where you can uh, enter in your name, your location. We'd love to hear where people are coming from. I know I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. Shoshana, where are you joining us from today? I'm in San Francisco, California. Wonderful. So we've got people from across the country. We have people joining. From, Mary Kay is coming from Virginia, Bridgewater, Virginia. Uh, we have Kathy from Kentucky. Uh, hi, Kathy. Thanks for joining. We have, I think it's Ada from Louisville, Kentucky. We have some folks from Green Bay, uh, some Michigan folks. So we have people coming to us across the country. Minnesota. I love to see where people are coming from. So happy that you're all joining us today for a very important conversation. Uh, you've joined uh, Home Instead Senior Care's Caregiver Chat Series. I'm Lakeland Hogan, Home Instead's gerontologist and caregiver advocate. Uh, and these are monthly chats that we do on various caregiver related topics. And so today we'll be focusing on what it means well to live till the end. But before we jump into the topic today, I do wanna go over just a few housekeeping items. First, if you're joining on Zoom, we are recording this webinar, so it will be made available afterwards. We'll send it to you via email, we'll post it on Facebook, on our website, and then also we're muting all of your lines so that you don't have to worry about the dog barking, the doorbell ringing, we can't hear you on our end. But we are going to take questions live, so feel free throughout the chat to type in your questions. On Zoom, you can do that through the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, just comment below and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can towards the end of today's uh, live chat. And then we hope that you'll stay connected to us. Uh, I mentioned this is a monthly live series that we do. Uh, so you can follow us on Facebook. We'll enter our, our Facebook web, uh, web address uh, into the chat. We hope that you uh, stay tuned for all of our chats that we have on, again, varying caregiving related topics. But today, uh, we'll be focusing on end of life. We know that end of life is a part of life and one part of life that should be honored and respected. Uh, but for many older adults and their families, planning for end of life is not something that they really look forward to discussing. But if we're able to proactively have these discussions, it can help older adults live well until the end. It can help put families at ease. But sometimes it can be really hard to know where to start discussing this topic, where to go for planning resources, and really what it truly means to live well to the end. So I'm very excited to be joined by an expert and thought leader in this area, Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Uh, she is the founder of endwellproject.org. Uh, she's also a practicing internist at Cross Health in San Francisco. She's a writer and leading voice in healthcare who regularly appears uh, as a medical contributor on CNN, MSNBC, CBS News. She also has bylines in Time Magazine, Scientific American, the San Francisco Chronicle, and many others. She's the executive producer of two Netflix Oscar-nominated films, Extremist and Endgame, and her most recent film, Robin's Wish, is a biographical documentary, documentary about actor and comedian Robin Williams. So, uh, Shoshana, thank you so much for joining us today. You have such a, a wealth of knowledge. You're well-respected in this area, and just it's a true honor to have you with us. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to, to be with you today. Well, thank you. Um, I know that this is a topic that we could probably speak on for hours and hours. I know your organization plans an entire day long event uh, to talk about this. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that event in, in just a bit. But can we start out with just kind of laying the groundwork? What does it mean to live well until the end? That's a great question. 
You know, it's, it's not one thing, right? So it's different for different people. Um, living well in, until the very end, from my perspective, is about optimizing my time uh, to be spent in ways that, that matter uh, and are meaningful to me. And I think that's the key is that it's, it's thinking about what, what matters most to you um, in your life. And if I'm sick, for example, it means receiving care uh, that's in line with my goals and my values. And so um, I think that there's a, there's a whole lot there um, that, you know, I think everybody needs to, to think about. And uh, it's, it's a very individual question and, and personal reflection. Yeah, that's so true. Um, you know, we all have a different idea about what quality of life means. And, and um, you know, for those that are battling health conditions or maybe a terminal diagnosis, uh, their idea of living well to the end might be different from someone who is not facing those types of challenges. Um, and, and I know that there's still quite a bit of stigma attached to talking about end of life. It's very taboo. I know Home Instead recently, we did a survey just to ask families about their end of life planning. And we found that older adults are far less comfortable discussing uh, their plan for their aging parents than their aging parent themselves. Um, and so sometimes it can just be a tough conversation to have amongst a family unit. So um, I guess, would you speak to maybe a little bit about why that is? Why is end of life planning still so taboo? Why do people not want to talk about it? Well, I think you're right. I mean, I, the conversation uh, about death, right, is is so uh, is so taboo. There's so much stigma in our culture. Um, we we aren't uh, you know thinking about it. We aren't talking about it, and therefore we aren't planning for it. It's it's really hidden away in our culture. And I think it's helpful to look back at at history. Um, really, for the vast majority of of humanity, we we've, we've been very familiar with the end of life. Um, we cared for our dying loved ones at home. Uh, we laid them out. You know. In, in the parlor when they died and we knew what rituals to perform after. Now I'm talking like a hundred years ago, right? And, and before mm -hmm. um, death was sort of an expected part of life. Um, it was accepted and, and it was really planned for. Granted, you know, people died much younger. Um, it, you know, it wasn't until medical technology became so advanced that we began spending months or even years of our lives in facilities or, or in hospitals um, near the end of life. And that essentially removed the experience of serious illness and death, I think, from the public consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so people are growing up not recognizing that that is um, for, for most of us, a really natural um, feature uh, of, of normal life, and especially for children um, who, who aren't around typically, you know, older, uh, older adults as they get sicker um, because they're institutionalized. Um, so it's, it's, I think, all of that, um, coupled with the fact that in medicine, which I know we'll, we'll talk about, you know, we, we sort of have a different culture uh, in, in terms of thinking about um, preserving life at all costs and not considering quality of life in a lot of these um, types of conversations. So it's, uh, it's, it's tricky in that there are so many factors that are at play, um, I think, that feed into this stigma. Um, but, you know, I love, I love this quote from my, my good friend, Lucy Kalanithi, whose husband wrote the book Book, when breath becomes air, um, he was a neurosurgeon and and died at very young at, at 36 um, from from lung cancer. And while he was dying, he wrote this beautiful memoir. Um, if you haven't if you haven't heard of it, um, when breath becomes air, and and she says, um, living and dying aren't separate things. We're doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that just is of course true, right? Um, but but gives such a beautiful perspective on and, and reframing on this conversation, I think. Yes, uh, I've read that book and it is a must read if, if people are interested. Would you mind just repeating the name and the title again, just in case people didn't catch that? Sure, it's called When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. Yes, and I, I love that quote about life being part of death. And uh, I mean, in, in the gerontology space, we talk about from the minute you're born, you're starting to age. Uh, and, you know, aging is not something that we as a culture uh, really embrace. Uh, and therefore, you know, that feeds right into end of life and those conversations uh, and really just normalizing it. I know it from a personal experience, um, we unfortunately had some sudden deaths when I was younger. And so I attended many funerals as a young child, but 
some children have never gone to a funeral or parents choose to not include them in an end of life type of celebration or funeral. And uh, from my perspective, and this is uh, just my perspective, I think that does a disservice to younger people because we uh, then have that, that stigma about end of life. And I think it does need to be part of discussion within family units. So I think that it's uh, great that we're having this discussion today. And you had mentioned, um, you know, the healthcare system and how it's set up in a way uh, that really doesn't necessarily always focus on a good death. Uh, we've been, we talked about that, that book that you mentioned, but there's also a movie called Being Mortal. Uh, Dr. Atul Agande, I probably mis misspelled, pronounced his last name, but uh, he produced this movie all about the healthcare system and how in medical school, you're not necessarily trained on how to handle conversations about death. And so would you mind just talking a little bit more about the healthcare system? And, and you're a physician, so maybe you can even speak to your own training um, and, and maybe maybe even share a little bit about how you eventually got, got into this area as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. Atul Gawande um, is a physician at Harvard and, and a writer for The New Yorker. The Being Mortal is actually a book. And then I think they turned it into that incredible right. um, documentary film. And um, he's actually speaking at our event uh, coming up really soon. So we're, we're thrilled because he really has been a, a major voice in the conversation around um, normalizing difficult uh, conversations related to serious illness and thinking about, you know, why as a society we, we've you know, ended up in, in where we are right now. Um, I would say that the healthcare system today is absolutely not set up in a way that promotes uh, a death that is um, in line with people's goals and values. I mean, you know, as doctors, and I can speak from my own experience, of course, we, we aren't just encouraged to prolong life. We're actually financially incentivized in a lot of ways. We're mm -hmm. paid within the healthcare system to do things to people right? Um, we know Medicare spending for patients in the last year of life is around six times what it is for other patients and accounts for about a, a quarter of the total Medicare budget. I think it's even a little more now. Um, and so, you know, we, we also don't, don't train clinicians in how to have these kinds of conversations. Um, according to a, to a 2016 JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, um, uh, uh, publication, you know, 70%, that's seven zero percent of, of doctors who were surveyed um, said that they had not been trained in how to talk to patients about, about serious illness, about things like, you know, what, what are your goals and values if, if time is short and how do you want to spend your time? So we've, we've created, unfortunately, a medical culture where death is seen as a failure. And mm -hmm. as doctors, we do everything we can to avoid failure. And I think how that plays out is that critical conversations rarely take place along people's medical journey to make sure that their values and their goals um, for living life are really honored up until the end. And that was one thing that really struck, struck me when I was, was training and why I got interested in this was I was spending my mandatory months caring for very sick patients in the intensive care unit and was just blown away by the number of um, often frail older adults who were uh, spending their, their final days or weeks in, in the intensive care unit, really hidden away from their loved ones, often um, in a lot of pain and, and suffering. And they didn't have a say in sort of the trajectory that landed them there. It was sort of the default thing, right, that we do in this country. And we, we definitely weren't taking important pauses along the way to make sure that they understood what was happening moment to moment and then talking with families and caregivers about, you know, today here, here's where we are. Um, this is what tomorrow and this is what next week or maybe next month, if there is a next month might look like. So it, it really was uh, initially quite shocking to me that our <laughs> role uh, was from my perspective to be healers and, and to truly help people uh, throughout the journey. And if cure is no longer possible, um, you know, there, there are so many ways that we can help to heal people um, beyond that. And I, I just wasn't seeing that happen. Um, and, and it wasn't until I got some exposure to the world of palliative care, which I know we'll talk a little bit about that I realized that there was another way forward and we really should be treating 
communication training as a procedure, just like we spend years, right? If you become a surgeon, learning how to take out a gallbladder, um, you should be spending, frankly, years learning how to perfect um, communication because it's something that can change your life just as much as having a major surgery can or doing some other kind of, of medical intervention. Um, so I, you know, I would, I'd really like to see that shift. I think it is slowly shifting in medical education, but I think we still have a long way to go. Well, thank you for that, that insight and uh, additional, you know, firsthand experience that, that you just provided. And I, I, I think you're right. I think communication is so much of what we do in every profession, I think. And so uh, our medical professionals, you know, that, that training that you mentioned uh, is so beneficial uh, for them as well. And I know you talked about, um, you know, how you, you witnessed older adults uh, in the intensive care unit, and that's where they've lived out their final days, weeks, or months. Um, how can families have conversations? How can they begin to, you know, plan? Um, and then what are some of the benefits of that plan? Why is it so important um, so that, you know, uh, you mentioned sometimes they don't always have a say in, in their care. How can we encourage families to have those discussions so that, that the person does have a say and they are involved in, in their uh, care decisions toward the end, even if they can't necessarily verbalize them for themselves? Yeah, these are great, great questions. I think, you know, I, I want to point out again that if, if people aren't aware, you know, by default in America, um, you, you will receive aggressive, invasive medical treatment um, if you become acutely sick, right? Um, no matter how old you are and no matter your underlying medical conditions, um, unless you opt out. Right. So that's why it's very important um, if, if the intensive care unit is not what you might want. Um, it's not to say that you shouldn't opt for that. Um, we, we provide you know, very high quality care in intensive care units all across the country. But if that's not what you want, it's very important to do something uh, called advanced care planning or, or serious illness uh, planning, which is so somewhat synonymous with, with end of life. Although I would try to think about it as moving it much further upstream um, and these are conversations that we can be having. I mean, I'm 40 that I have right now with my husband, that my parents who are in their seventies and, and completely well um, are talking about and thinking about. And I think in particular, you know, the COVID pandemic has shown us the importance of clearly expressing our, our personal wishes for medical care in the setting of a serious illness or in the setting of an emergency. Um, and, and this is really making, this is about making decisions about the healthcare that you would want to receive if you're facing a medical crisis. Um, and then really these are decisions you, you have to make based on your, your personal values, your preferences and goals, and then have discussions with the people that you love and, and ideally your healthcare professionals um, so that they can best advocate um, for you. So, you know, I, I think that there's a number of reasons why this is important beyond the, the obvious. I think that the data actually suggests that um, many people feel like it's a gift to the people that you love. You're sort of removing a sort of burden of, of having to make a decision for someone um, that, that you haven't discussed or you aren't sure about. So when you clearly delineate you know, some of these, these preferences, these goals and values, and you share them with your loved ones, it's, it's quite helpful. And honestly, it can bring people closer together because this isn't a conversation really about dying. It's more about living and, mm -hmm. and what living well looks like. Um, and then additionally, I think a lot of people, especially Americans, enjoy autonomy and control. And the more that we can be specific about what that looks like for us, um, you know, spell it out in a document, talk to the people that you love. Um, it, it can be quite helpful. And I can tell you as a physician, when, when my patients have had these conversations, uh, it makes all the difference in the world when I'm meeting someone for the first time in the ER or in the ICU, if there's been a lot of frank discussion with family uh, about this is, this is mom, this is who she is as a person, this is what she values. Can you please talk to us about how we can provide the best care um, so she can live as well as possible for as long as possible? So it, it absolutely, uh, it makes a big difference. And these conversations, like I said, should start really early on and be revisited 
several times throughout life as circumstances change. Yeah, I I like I like that how you talk about it not not necessarily as an end of life discussion, but just part of how you want to live your best life. Uh, and as we've talked about how you know death is part of life, so we plan for so much of our lives. You know, we uh, plan our education, and then we plan for having families a lot of times, or going on vacation, or getting saving for a new car. So why wouldn't we also plan for this very important part of our life? And so I think having conversations like this really does help to normalize it. And, and a lot of the work that you do uh, through your uh, your organization, which we'll get to in just a little bit, I know you you are working hard to just normalize the conversation. Um, but I guess if, if I'm a family caregiver and I'm listening to this chat, I might be thinking, you know, where do I start? I mean, because there is a lot of aspects to end of life planning. It's not just one document or like you said, not just one conversation, but um, where would you suggest that families start? How, how can they take a first step? Yeah, there's a number of tools and platforms out there that can help. Um, I have a few favorites, uh, one being um, the online, the website called Cake, um, like the food cake. Um, there's also the Five Wishes, which is a more kind of ethical will values-based document that you can download off the internet. The Conversation Project does a great job as well. Death Over Dinner um, is a way that you can facilitate a, a, a Zoom dinner. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, well, during the pandemic, it's tricky to have you know people together in person, but um, to facilitate a conversation um, about this and gives you great prompts and information to share out with your guests. Um, I think the, the, the key kinds of questions um, that I really encourage people to think about and then use as a framing for this conversation is, you know, what's the story of my life? Uh, what and who make my life meaningful? Um, are there any activities that define my life? Um, and if I were to get sick and not be able to do those activities, um, how much suffering would I be willing to go through for a chance to get better? Um, who would I want or not want in my decision-making process? Um, and then if for, for people who maybe are, are facing a serious illness, um, when, when you think about the future, you know, what, what worries you the most? Um, where do you find peace and comfort? Um, Atul Gawande, you know, says, what does a good day look like for you? And then what trade-offs would you be willing to make again for a chance to get better? Um, so I think all of these conversations or these prompts are really, really helpful and get to the heart of the important pieces. It's not about exactly what medical intervention you would want when. That's important, I think, to, to leave to the clinical staff to sort of talk about with you. I think these values-based conversations are, are truly at the core of, of what is, is key for this. And I think when we, when we think about this conversation, it's important to know that it doesn't have to be perfect. We can sort of ease our loved ones into it by just bringing it up um, casually and we can make mistakes. Um, it doesn't need to start with a you know, legal document that we have to check boxes and write things down. It really starts with a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I have to say the conversation is much more important from my perspective than the document. Um, the document is more of a legal you know, thing. And it's great to have it, you know, within a medical chart, but, but truly when it comes down to it, it's whether you've thought first thought about these questions for yourself and have you shared them with the people that you love who would be in a scenario where they'd be advocating for you. So I, I think th these are a, a great place to start. I would agree. I, I like how you phrased those questions because it really is kind of like doing a life review. We talk about that sometimes, um, you know, reflecting back on life and what's important to you. And I like how you, you talked about, you know, what activities do I enjoy most and um, what sacrifices am I willing to make from a healthcare perspective or treatment perspective to, for the chance to get better and to be able to continue those activities. I think that framing up the conversation in, in those types of ways really, they help make this conversation more approachable for families. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, and I think um, I guess another question that I have for you is, you know, as a community, as a society, as a healthcare system, what, what are ways we can all work together 
to improve these end of life experiences, to engage in these conversations? Well, I mean, just joining this chat today for everybody out there, you're, you're taking a big step forward. I think like you've been talking about normalizing these conversations, making it okay to talk about these things. Um, I think from a uh, healthcare systems perspective, we honestly need to shift incentives such that we're not just paid to do things to people, that, that quality of life and individual goals and values are a part of that conversation and thus part of care. Um, I think it's going to take a long time to get us to a place uh, where, where that's possible, but I think that's what we all should be aiming for. Um, we need to train all clinicians in how to have difficult conversations. That's where it starts. Um, if your doctor is too scared or doesn't know how to talk to you about your prognosis, it's pretty hard to plan around your final days, weeks, months, years of life if you don't, you're not even aware um, of what's going on. And so making that part of all training, I think is really critical. And that is shifting within, within healthcare. Um, I think we need to recognize the value in early palliative care consultations and use palliative care alongside curative treatment. Palliative care, you know, is, is a field of medicine that supports people and their families who are facing serious illness. It can be used at any time during the course of illness, ideally at the time of a serious illness diagnosis. So years and years upstream um, from, from the end of life. And uh, it, it consists typically of a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, sometimes a chaplain, a pharmacist, people who really wrap around and think about care in a very holistic way beyond just the physical manifestations of an illness. Um, it, it can do so much good. And the data actually shows that the earlier people engage with palliative care, the longer they live, and the better quality of life they have, which is fantastic. And what I think we're all aiming for here. Um, and I think, you know, finally, unfortunately, people uh, need the consumers of healthcare need to advocate for what they want um, and ask for palliative care. If you're not understanding what's going on, recognize that you have every right uh, and, and we welcome you to ask questions about what's happening, especially if you're an advocate for your loved one or you're the patient in the bed and you should feel, you should feel absolutely okay with saying, hang on, let's have a conversation about what's happening here. I wanna better understand what's going on and, and let's work together on, on how to best care for me. So I think the shift in healthcare, frankly, is not gonna come from within. I think it's gonna come from consumers uh, demanding better of our system. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that you covered palliative care because I think people, there's just such a misunderstanding of, of what palliative care is or people don't know that it's available. And like you mentioned, people ha have a better quality of life uh, when they utilize palliative care. Um, and But I think sometimes too that people get palliative care confused with hospice. And then hospice seems to have really have uh, kind of a, a stigma attached to it. A lot of times people also don't engage in hospice early enough. They wait until the last two weeks of life and they really don't get the true benefit of the service. Um, and, and so would you mind just maybe diving a little deeper on palliative care versus hospice and uh, you know, what are the uh, purposes of both? Yeah, so hospice is actually a kind of palliative care. Um, it is typically uh, used within the last six months to a year of life um, and really focuses on um, making the patient and, and family as comfortable as possible, um, moving away from curative intent and much more toward, um, toward comfort. And, you know, again, that that six month sort of window is, is a really arbitrary Medicare designation um, around insurance reimbursement. Um, palliative care is, is a much more sort of overarching field of medicine that's been around um, and is, is a specialty uh, boarded field for the last 12 or so years. Um, and as I mentioned, it consists of, you know, a team that gets together, including a physician and a nurse and a social worker and and a chaplain to, to think about, you know, how can we 
um, best support this person and their family and their caregivers um, who are facing a serious illness and focuses on not only the physical manifestations of, of illness, but also the psychosocial, the existential, um, the spiritual distress that often accompanies um, a, a life limiting illness. And when, when that can be provided alongside chemotherapy or alongside surgery or some, or other things where you're all, where you are also focused on getting cured of your illness, um, it can be such a wonderful benefit, uh, for people. And ideally again is, is used years and years upstream, uh, from hospice. Thank you for, for giving that overview. I think that hopefully that is helpful to those listening. And, and as uh, Shoshana mentioned, families can, can ask for those palliative services. Sorry, Shoshana, do you have something to add? I was just gonna say, I always forget to mention this, but it's widely available in this country. Um, something like you know 95 plus percent of facilities have palliative care. Um, so just know that you're not asking for something that no one's ever heard of. This is very much, uh, you know, part of, of the offerings and, and people should, should be asking for it if it's not being readily uh, offered. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, so I think having that better understanding of, of palliative care and, and how it can be helpful will hopefully make it, uh, you know, more highly in demand and just more part of business as usual for our healthcare system. And, and hopefully um, some of these uh, themes that we've been talking about um, of, you know, medical systems being incentivized in a way that doesn't always promote, uh, you know, the best outcome for the, the individual, the patient, hopefully that will all continue to change as we all start to work together. So, so thank you for that insight. Uh, I know we're going to open it up for questions in, in just a few minutes. So if you are thinking of a question for Shoshana, uh, please feel free to chat in or ask in the Q&A box. Uh, and if you're on Facebook, just provide a comment in the comment section and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, but I think before we open up for questions, since we are living through really unprecedented times, Shoshana, we're living through a pandemic uh, with a virus that has impacted many people um, maybe personally, maybe they know someone who has had it or passed away from it. Maybe they themselves have a fear of getting the virus. Um, and uh, we've been experiencing just a lot of different emotions and maybe we've been confronted with our own mor mortality. Uh, maybe we've been faced with grief. Um, maybe it's the loss of a person or the loss of a part of our life that we always knew. Um, how, how has COVID-19 really impacted end-of-life conversations, quality-of-life conversations? Uh, from your perspective, what have, what have you seen? Um, I, would, I would love to hear your insights on that. Well, we're in a very unique moment, period of time, to say the least. Uh, the pandemic has shown all of us, I think, just how fragile life is, mm -hmm. uh, that tomorrow is never a given, no matter how old you are. Uh, it's also shined a light on, on the hidden world of caregivers, both our frontline healthcare workers and informal family caregivers, as well as, as you mentioned, you know, grief and loss, both on a personal and then a massive collective scale. I think uh, palliative care uh, has become the job of many, many clinicians, especially in places where they've been hit very hard by COVID. Um, so ER doctors, nurses, primary care doctors, ICU clinicians, um, because of the speed and severity of COVID, you know, so many clinicians have had to learn on the fly about mm -hmm. how to talk to someone about their, about their wishes, if they would want to be intubated, um, if, if it's possible that they, you know, wouldn't come off the machine. Um, if time is short, do they want to be in the hospital or in hospice? So I think the pandemic has really shown all of us that having conversations with the people that you love, uh, clearly expressing your, your wishes, right, is, is so important and assigning, you know, what we call a healthcare proxy, meaning someone who could speak for you if you can't speak for yourself mm -hmm. is so critical. And then, you know, on, on the flip side, uh, I think this world of, of grief has been just you know, massive, right? So in a lot of ways, we're all experiencing some degree of grief right now. Mm -hmm. Even for those of us who haven't lost someone we love, we're still experiencing these feelings of loss that are, that are brought on um, by the loss of a job or not getting to go to college or losing the predictability of, of the life that we had hoped to live. 
Um, so it's, it's complicated. And I think a lot of people are just tapping into or realizing that, that a lot of these emotions that we're feeling that are new and different are potentially related to those, those feelings. And we need to allow that to happen and to talk about it. And, you know, I love, I love the, the phrase, it's okay to not be okay mm -hmm. once in a while, um, to, to just give ourselves permission to feel whatever we're feeling. Cause this is an incredibly difficult time. And I think as a country, we need to build a whole new vocabulary going forward from this time to talk about the societal experience uh, of mourning, of grief uh, for, for people that we know, people that we don't know. And again, giving ourselves the space and the permission to really feel our feelings. Um, this is so helpful in, in healing. And I'm hoping that, that that happens in this country because it's so necessary. Thank you for your thoughts on that. And I, I agree, we, we all are experiencing grief in our own way and we do need to find healthy ways to express that and, and to recognize that, that it is okay to feel those feelings. And I know, um, you know a lot of uh, family caregivers that, that are likely watching today, uh, their worlds may be turned upside down because maybe services aren't available to them uh, to help their loved one like they used to be or Maybe they have a loved one in a facility and they can no longer visit them. And, and so, you know, we're all going through some sort of grief and challenge. And so I, I, I think that you're right that we're going to walk away from this time with new perspective on, on some things. And I think a new set of vocabulary to talk about it um, is wonderful. And, and I know before we open it up for questions, you mentioned your upcoming events several times. And I know it, it in December, if, if I remember correctly, and, and you'll be um, bringing this topic to life in uh, what uh, in various talks from, from various people. So would you mind sharing a little bit more about your upcoming event and, and how people can take part? Yeah, so I started the, the nonprofit EndWell um, at endwellproject.org as a conference about four years ago to help transform how we think about and talk about and develop solutions um, for making caregiving and serious illness and the end of life, as well as grief, something more human centered. Um, and to really break down silos and invite new voices to the conversation. I feel so strongly that the end of life is not a medical issue alone to be solved, but a part of the human experience and deserves our attention. Um, so now Endwell has, has moved beyond just a conference. You know, we convene people for many events throughout the year this year virtually. And, and we're also a media platform for content. So we push out, you know, a, a lot of, um, a lot of talks and discussions on social media and on our website. Um, we have millions of our millions of views of our talks across all of our social channels every year, which has been wonderful. Um, this year's December 10th event is virtual and it's free for the first time ever. It, everyone is invited. It's called Take 10 and it features celebrities. So people that are household names and then unsung heroes um, focused on, on caregiving, on serious illness, on mental health, uh, specifically related to social isolation as well as the end of life and, and collective grief. And the idea uh, for the name came about because we really want people to take 10 minutes to, uh, to reflect about your own life, to then think about the end of it and talk with the people that you love. And we have some amazing partners involved, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation that focuses on military caregivers, the Who's Teen Cancer America, um, Sheryl Sandberg's Option B, the Motion Picture and Television Fund, uh, Hollywood Health and Society, and the celebrities are you know, people from Atul Gawande to Andy Cohen to Larry King, Soledad O'Brien is RMC, Taraji P. Henson, um, and uh, really, you know, is, is also going to have some amazing educators and clinicians and caregivers and designers speaking and to provide a forum at the end of the year for a global community to come together and collectively kind of process our experience in the wake of, of COVID. Um, again, this is, you know, for a general audience, everyone is welcome and you can find more information at endwellproject.org. Thank you so much for sharing about that event. I've marked my calendar. I am looking forward to it. Um, and so we hope that you all will 
will um, join as well. We posted the link uh, for everyone to be able to access that. So thank you so much, Shoshana, for, for a great discussion so far. And now we're opening it up to some questions from our audience. I know we've had some come in. Again, if you have a question, please use the chat box or the Q&A box on Zoom, or just leave your comment in the question, or leave your comment on Facebook in the comment section below. Um, I know we've had a couple come in. Um, one, Betty is asking about comfort care um, and, you know, um, I guess one, I'm going to add to Betty's question, you know, what is comfort care? Because we hear that term thrown around sometimes. Uh, and then um, what is it as you see it for a person in long-term care who can't ask for things or can't speak for themselves? And I know we have a lot of family caregivers of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And, and towards the end of that disease progression, a lot of times you know, these individuals can't express their wants and wishes. So I guess it's a, a long, uh, I added a lot to Betty's question, but if you wouldn't mind sharing um, some thoughts for Betty, I know she would appreciate it. Yeah, so I just wanna, I wanna clarify, the, the question is about what is comfort care? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from, from my perspective, comfort care is, is largely synonymous with hospice care. And that is a, a form of, of palliative care that's focused on the last typically six months of life for somebody where you really transition your, your focus to saying, you know, what, how can I maximize the comfort for this individual um, based on where they are, whether it's a hospital, uh, a nursing facility at home. And, and we do things that are solely focused on the goal of, of, of comfort. And this is typically uh, around the final um, weeks or months of someone's life. And you typically also avoid uh, returning to the hospital or aggressive interventions at that point. It's something that you decide as a patient or decide as a family that that is a goal of care is, is to focus on comfort. Thank you for answering that question. Um, we have another question um, and I'm not quite sure what this acronym stands for. So maybe you do VSED. Um, could you please discuss that as an end of life option? Um, so I, do you, I'm hoping that you know what that acronym stands for. Yeah, so V said, VSED is voluntary stopping of eating and drinking. And again, this is, this is a um, voluntary uh, choice by a patient who decides that they are gonna stop taking in uh, food and water um, with the goal of, of, of hastening death. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really, you know, interesting, uh, thing to sort of think about. We, we, we consider, uh, nutrition, um, food, water, hydration to be, you know, essential, uh, to life and, and part of, of comfort. However, if, if people, um, decide that, uh, based on their, their illness and their quality of life, that that is not something they want to continue, um, voluntary stopping of eating and drinking is something that has been done for, for quite a long time. Um, and, um, the one thing I would say is that I've heard, you know, from, from, from families and caregivers is it's, it's hard, um, because we want to be able to provide that food, uh, and, and water for people, especially if they, if they're looking thirsty, um, and it's, it can be, uh, somewhat challenging to, to do that. Um, specifically if you're in your own home caring for somebody, um, but it's something that, um, people opt for, um, who, um, who desire a, a quicker ending. Thank you for answering that question and clarifying um, what that stands for. Um, so uh, we have another question from Jean. Is palliative care developed uh, to the point of offering patients and their families um, the or help them work through the stages of dying? Um, I know she referenced Dr. Kubler-Ross uh, the stages of grief. So does palliative care help family caregivers kind of work through, family members work through grief? Absolutely. So there are so many elements of grief, including anticipatory grief that starts occurring before uh, death. 
And uh, so absolutely everybody on a, on a palliative care team is, is trained um, as, as our hospice professionals um, to, to support families through the, the grief journey. Unfortunately, uh, resources in, in many places tend to be limited around the grief experience. And so that's one area that I think uh, is, is very, very important to, um, you know, to ask for and also seek out other resources for, for dealing with grief. I think we're realizing that um, grief can last a whole lifetime. This is not a discrete period of time. Um, everybody has a very different experience uh, through it. And, and when we don't recognize that this can be for many, many years and, and have ebbs and flows, um, it, can be, it can be difficult. And so um, again, you know, the more that we can be talking about uh, you know, how we're feeling on a personal level and thinking about as a society, um, grief, especially now given COVID is so, is so critically important. Thank you so much for your insight on that question. Um, our next question comes from Laura. She um, says that cremation is planned for her mom uh, who just went into a nursing home and she's on hospice and has been uh, for some time. And um, she says she's kept her alive, but now that she's in a nursing home, she's saying, how do I let her go? Uh, so I think that that's a common question family caregivers have. And um, so any thoughts for Laura um, as she is trying to, to process that, that question of how do I let my mom go? Hmm. It's so hard. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry um, about your mom. Um, I think, you know, uh, I guess I would say, you know, from, from my perspective in my own life and from, from caring for caring for patients, I mean, thinking about, you know, what your, what your mom, you know, truly values and, and making sure that, you know, the, the, the care that she's receiving, um, is, is sort of what she would want if she was able to, you know, speak for herself or if she is, you know, that, that it's in line with what, what she cares about, um, you know, letting go of someone that you love is uh, probably the hardest thing that we, that we ever do. Um, so the more that you can um, lean on the people that you love for support, um, it's, it's, uh, it's undoubtedly a, a very, very tough time. And the pandemic, I think, makes things even worse, um, given the limitations and our ability to spend time with people uh, near the end of life. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, just thinking about you know, your mom and, and what she would want in this moment. And that would probably be for you to um, find a place of, of peace around this whole experience. Thank you for that, that answer. And, and Laura, we, our, our thoughts are with you as, as you're going through that with your mom. Um, another question has come in from, from Ada. She's saying, you know, a missing piece of the conversation uh, a lot of the times is about celebrating life after death. And it's an important, it's really important to arrange for that. And um, there's some fear of the unknown, but she's asking, you know, what, um, what is your opinion on prearranging a life celebration or I'm, I'll expand that to funeral planning as well. So prearranging uh, for, for after you die, um, having sort of a celebration of your life. I mean, I think for some people that that it absolutely is, is a great thing and, and they're in a, in a headspace where they can do that. I think for others who are facing serious illness and the end of life, there's still a whole lot of fear. And so it wouldn't be a fit right? For somebody like that, who's, who's, who's troubled or, or distressed to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to now plan my funeral or, or, you know, invite people to my celebration of life for after I'm gone. But I do think for it's, it can absolutely be this, this beautiful therapeutic experience for somebody who's nearing the end to say, even before they die to bring people together, right. And have a celebration of life, um, even to say goodbye. Um, so there, there's actually a, a number of wonderful online platforms out there that can help facilitate these kinds of, of celebrations and especially now virtually um, with uh, it opening up the world in terms of who can, who can attend these things and, and um, sort of 
have that celebration of life with people. I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's just, I, I think my earlier point was that not everybody is in a space where they can you know, do that, but I do, I, I think it can be really helpful and therapeutic. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have another question that came in uh, from a, a, a professional who works in palliative care. She is a nurse and she says um, one of the hardest parts of her job is being forced to keep somebody's body alive uh, past the possibility of a meaningful recovery. There are things worse than death, she says. Um, as a palliative care nurse, she sees this happen a lot. And so she says, how do you get family members to see this? That's a really tough situation. So Jackie, thank you for sharing your perspective. Yeah, it, it's, it's very tough. And I have personally experienced that quite a lot. And that's one of the reasons that I do the work that I do is because I'm trying to very, very upstream from that acute crisis, show people that we should really be valuing quality of life and honoring people's goals and values for living their best life um, and not keeping people alive at all costs, if, if possible. Um, so it's, it, it breaks your heart, you know, to see that happen. Um, you know, I, I think what I would say is that when, when, when a family is in that, that acute moment of crisis, seeing a loved one that they're not ready to let go of, um, and, and the medical team is asked to keep this person alive, despite, you know, treatment being futile. Um, I think I've realized that you have to meet people where they are. Um, there, there's no amount of explaining, um, typically that can, um, force somebody to, to see the situation differently. And it often just takes time, um, which again, breaks everybody's heart to see it, you know, play out in front of you. But um, we're, we're, you know, taking care of the family just as much as we're taking care of the patient. And so uh, again, you know, uh, meeting them where they are in terms of their thinking and, um, and sort of walking them through this process. This process. Um, um, is, it's, is, it's is hard, hard and can be really painful, but, but so important. Thank you for that, for that answer to, uh, to Jackie's question. Um, we have time for just a couple more. Um, we have, Betty has uh, kind of laid out a situation. She says, how do you deal with the guilt if you change your mind and see the consequences after you've given uh, a no active treatment um, or you've communicated no active treatment to a person with Alzheimer's. Um, and she said, this person has serious ch chest congestion, probably from aspiration, which will continue. So I think Betty's question is, um, how do you deal with the guilt if you make a, a choice for your loved one and uh, see the consequences of that? That's a great question. Um, that's, that's very hard, I think. Well, first and foremost, I would say that you can change your mind at any time, right? So it, I, I do think it's important to, to honor the wishes of the patient, of, of the loved one um, as much as possible. But if, if there are things that could benefit from a hospitalization or more treatment, um, I think know that even if you've opted for a comfort-based approach, you can change your mind. Um, this is not, nothing is written in stone, um, but I would, I would bring it back to, you know, how can we best provide care that this person indicated that they wanted and that, that, that meets the goal of, of, of comfort and a dignified ending. And, and maybe, you know, in the example of chest congestion, there are lots of medications that we can use to help ease people's suffering. So it, it may be that touching base with your medical team, whether it's hospice, palliative care, somebody else, and then saying, hey, I'm watching my loved one uh, appear to choke and suffer. What can we do about this? I mean, mm -hmm. that is absolutely within the scope of, of, of what we do. And we want to make the person as comfortable as possible. And then I guess for a final question, um, we have someone asking, you know, what if the patient's not able to communicate his or her wishes? Uh, for example, if there's a language barrier or cognitive decline like Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and assuming they have not indicated their wishes. Um, ahead of I would time. assume so. The, it wasn't mentioned in the question, but maybe let's talk about that scenario. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's so hard. I mean, I think that gets to the importance of when when cognitive decline is starting to be diagnosed to be having these conversations, right? If we know we know the illness trajectory, right, with dementia, um, it it can be, you know, usually months and months, or rather years and years of time. It's it's very clear that there unfortunately is no cure, and so the earlier that we can be engaging in these kinds of conversations, the better. I would say if there isn't a family member or loved one who's been you know, deemed the healthcare proxy or healthcare decision maker for that person, unfortunately, they will receive very ag aggressive, invasive treatment if they become sick um, or if they, you know, emergently need uh, medical care. And so that is uh, very challenging. Uh, I've, I've taken care of many patients for whom that's been the scenario. And again, it's, it's heartbreaking because you don't have a way to find out who is this person? Um, what, what did they care about? Um, am I providing care that they would have wanted? Uh, and you, you have to think that often as, as the days and weeks go on in that kind of scenario, that this is not what they would want and, and we're prolonging suffering for people. And so all the more reason to be having these conversations early and often. Thank you so much for, for that answer and, and for being so open to answering questions from our audience today. I know that end of life is not always an easy conversation to have. Um, and I think if, if I were to kind of sum up today's chat in, in a couple thoughts, it would be, uh, let's start talking about end of life far before uh, it's ever a reality for any of us. Let's start to normalize this conversation um, and, and get our families talking not only about end of life, but what's meaningful to us in our lives and how does that carry us through end of life. Um, and also um, have conversations with your healthcare provider. Make sure your wishes are known um, so that if you, if you get to a point where decisions need to be made, um, those around you that, that love you and the medical professionals that are caring for you, they know uh, what's important to you. Uh, Shoshana, any other thoughts that you would add uh, that would kind of sum up uh, our discussion today? No, I just want to say to everybody, thank you for joining. I mean, this is what it looks like to shift culture, to, to talk about things that are traditionally uh, taboo or are stigmatized in our society. And so I encourage all of you to you know, just take a moment to reflect on what this all means for you in your life uh, and then consider talking to the people that you love about it. It goes a long, long way. It brings people closer together and it really you know, helps us as, as clinicians to provide the best care for people. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all will go check out the endwellproject.org website to learn more about the Take 10 event and the wonderful resources that Shoshana and her organization have provided. Um, Shoshana, thank you again so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining. I mentioned this is part of a monthly caregiver chats series. Next month, we will be focusing on caregiving in crisis with our partners at Caregiver Action Network on November 17th. So we hope that you will uh, visit our website and register for that event. Uh, again, this um, live chat today was recorded. We'll put that back out there so all of you have access to it. Uh, you can share it with those who might not have been able to join. But we thank you all so much for for joining us today, for sending in your questions. Uh, and thank you again to Shoshana uh, for her insight on this topic, uh, living well until the end. Thank you everyone, have a great rest of the day. Bye.